Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Joining us today is Dr. Thomas Sowell. He's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He's the author of a great many books. His newest is Wealth, Poverty, and Politics, Revised and Enlarged Edition. And incidentally, it is unlikely that either Aaron or I would be working at the Cato Institute if it wasn't for Dr. Sowell's work. So this is a particular pleasure for us. So welcome to Free Thoughts, Dr. Sowell. Thank you. Let's start with what the central question you're setting out to answer in this book is? I guess the, the central question could be, could be said to be uh, disparities in income and wealth uh, within nations and between nations. But really the more fundamental question to me is why people ever thought that there was any realistic possibility of even approximate equality given all the things that go into the production of wealth. And how all of those things vary enormously from one group to another, from one country to another, from one geographic setting to another. Uh, and, and much, much of the book is going into these kinds of things. And then only in the last section do I turn to questions of internal differences uh, in within a country and uh, in, in income and wealth. That's the political implications of the book, which is interesting because there are many books about wealth, the wealth and poverty of nations. But some people who would read the book say the first part, books like Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, for example, uh, say talk about some similar type of issues. But you think that the, the political implications of this are particularly important for many debates that we have today? Oh, absolutely, and uh, no, no, nowhere, no more so than in the so-called debate that took place. Uh, uh, yesterday. So one of the things that you mentioned several times in the book that I thought was interesting and is worth unpacking is this – we tend to – when people are talking about income inequality or inequality between countries, um, they, they tend to say here's a, here's a possible – a difference, a correlation, but then it bleeds into causation. So if employers are paying one group less than another group, that must be the cause of the one group having less income than the other or – and so I'm, I'm curious about – you say that these factors and you list a lot of them are maybe real but not determinative. Uh, yes, I guess the, the crucial fa fallacy uh, is in believing that the inequality existed wherever you happen to have kept, uh, kept – uh, collected the uh, statistics. Uh, I mean it's, it's a really a very simple fallacy. Uh, for example, uh, after discovering that uh, children are raised differently in different groups, uh, the, there are fewer or, and more or greater numbers of books in homes in different groups. Uh, everything that you can measure is measurably different. And there have been years prior to the uh, – from the time of birth to the time that the person applies to a job at a particular employer, there have been all kinds of differences. And now if the employer uh, treats everyone exactly alike uh, and you know, promotes them or uh, demotes them according to the same standards, there will nevertheless be very d different outcomes at the employer for reasons that originated years before they ever saw the employer. It's interesting because a, a bunch of my progressive friends, uh, your, your thesis is obviously important to take account of, for example, the number of words that someone has heard uh, before they're five years old, which is a, a, a pretty profound difference. But I have pro progressive friends who understand this and therefore they advocate for extreme uh, progressive policies that get into the home. They understand that the differences go back before the point you measure them or before someone is employed. So they think that the government should actually get involved in those places beforehand, uh, which seems to be accepting your thesis but going to a place of big government that is probably undesirable. It is fascinating that uh, it doesn't bother them. To, uh, they don't bother to check what has been the uh, effect of previous government interventions. Uh, uh, socially, economically, and otherwise, which, which would uh, not not make that the most obvious uh, way you would think of curing a problem. So, a progressive, or at least someone who's more a fan of government intervention to address these problems, could they make the following sort of argument, though, that you said? So, okay, so let's take the example of um, disparities in pay between workers, either within a firm or between firms, um, and so that's the point that we choose to measure the inequality um, 
maybe because it's easier to measure it there than it is elsewhere. But it might be because we think that's the a the most important inequality at the given time. That you know the inequality of how much people make has then profound repercussions for what they can do going forward. But also because we could say that the the causal chain. So there might be a cause for why they're getting paid less. That as at some point in the past, like they had access to worse education or different styles of upbringing. But the causation also goes forward into the future that yes, we can't go back and fix the fact that some people had a worse upbringing in different ways than others. But right now, we could say here's an inequality and if we address this inequality, not only do we address it now, but we will address it going forward because then those people will be capable of providing the kind of upbringing for their children that will keep them out of these troubles in the future. Uh, I'm always impressed by the ingenuity that can go into these arguments. Uh, if it's just a matter of income, uh, that, that, that might make some sense. But when it's a, there's a whole constellation of causes behind the existing inequalities uh, in ability to earn income, I don't know how, why anyone would think that just by changing one factor, namely income, uh, you would then uh, uh, cure all these other problems that led to the initial inequality that you're concerned about. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned in the book, there are people who are quite uh, prosperous who have very few books in their home. Uh, and it is very systematic. You can go back through history. When uh, Olmsted was making his uh, trips through the uh, antebellum South, he noticed that there were plantation owners uh, who seldom had many books in their, in their homes. It wasn't that they couldn't afford books. That was not part of what their culture led them to do. Meanwhile, in Scotland, 100 years earlier, ordinary people, working people, uh, uh, had books. Uh, and those who couldn't afford books, there were lending libraries all over Scotland so that you could go in for a few pennies, uh, borrow a book, and read it, and so on. The question is, uh, do you want the books? Do you see Do you see the importance of books? And if you don't, you can be a millionaire and remain an ignoramus. Now, aside from books, you, you go – your chapters are, or your sections are divided into different factors that contribute to this inequality that we've been talking about of why it would be absurd to expect uh, equal performance amongst these groups. Uh, so let's talk about the, the first one of those that you discuss. You call, you call it geographical factors. Uh, what are some of the geographical factors? Do you look at world history that, that make people have unequal outcomes now? Oh, my gosh. There's so many. I don't know where to start. Uh, one of the big factors uh, is that navigable waterways cut the cost of transportation drastically. That is, uh, land transport has always been much more expensive than water transport. And for that reason, cities are all around the world. Um, any major, almost every major city in the world is located on a navigable waterway. Uh, that would – yeah, the navigable waterways, yes. So if your culture grew up, say, in the mountains – uh, which you discussed the the kind of mountain people, uh, then you have a detriment that could run forward several centuries in terms of the performance of your of your culture, just based on access to these kind of waterways. Absolutely, there's a wonderful book out about a, a mountain man who came down and went went on to Yale and became a lawyer, uh, and uh, the struggles he had all along the way just from the fact that he came from a culture that was not designed to, to produce that kind of career. And he has so many problems that, are, that a person born on the flatlands would never have had. And of course, yeah, so the world is different in a lot of different places. I, I, I said the, the mountain man, I had read the, the J.D. Vance book too about mountain people. And of course, that's across the world. Mountain people are, one thing you bring up that's particularly interesting is that they're prone to feuding not just in the Hatfields and the McCoys, but in other places too. Yes, Thailand, uh, Tibet, Afghanistan, you name it. So the, obviously the geographical factors influence the cultural factors. Um, but are there, are there more cultural factors besides say just a, a propensity for knowledge acquisition or actually using large libraries that can influence wealth? Oh, many of them. Uh, one, one of them that people seldom give any thought to is honesty. 
that in a society where there is where there is widespread dishonesty, corruption, uh, it can have have wonderful natural resources, can have highly intelligent people, and yet they can be poor and backward for centuries, because the high cost of uh, trying to do any kind of business in a country with widespread dishonesty. One of the things I quote and is just one example of differences is there have been experiments done where uh, some organization will go out and leave a dozen uh, wallets with money in them and identification in them uh, in various places around the city. And then they will wait and see how many of those uh, wallets come back with the money still in them. Uh, in, in, uh, in Oslo, for example, uh, 100% of them came back with all, with, with all the money intact. In, uh, in Lisbon, uh, only one out of 12 came back. And that one was brought in by a visitor from the Netherlands. <laughs> you know? So, so you see, you see that there are other ways of measuring it. They measure uh, which UN diplomats in New York pay their parking tickets, since all of them are immune to prosecution. Well, uh, over a five-year period, uh, the 24 uh, UN diplomats from uh, Egypt ran up thousands of unpaid parking tickets. Canada, with the same number of diplomats had no unpaid parking tickets over those whole five-year period. And you, you, however you look at any of these things, you find these enormous differences. Uh, and that means there's a great difference in the uh, viability of, of uh, investment in any of these countries, because you're, you're likely to have your, your investment stolen from you in some of these places, but not in others. Some people might, might wonder, though, how, how persistent culture is, because... I mean, is it really the case that if if Egyptians? I mean, it is a pretty astounding because these are all parking tickets that they didn't even have to pay, right? They were That's just right. paying. Yeah. So Canadians do seem pretty nice in this in this equation, but these are actually na Canadian nationals who are working for the UN. Is there any reason to believe that Canadians moving to America or or people from Norwegians moving to America three generations later will be more honest? Well, that, that's an interesting question. But what's even more interesting is that that question is never asked when in discussing uh, immigration policy. Uh, you know, that, uh, that, 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 that people talk about immigrants in the abstract as if there are no differences. You mentioned about how long this goes on. Back in the middle of the 19th century, John Stuart Mill pointed out the widespread corruption in Russia and said that this would be an enormous handicap in the economic development of that country. A hundred years later, all the data indicate that that is absolutely so. Uh, one study showed that uh, an oil company in Russia would, uh, the stock from an oil country, company in Russia uh, would be worth some small fraction of what the same oil company would be worth in, in America. Because the market assumes that the people who run that oil company will loot it from the inside uh, in Russia. So the, 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 there's, there's a huge difference in uh, where, where you're willing to invest because of that. Well, the interesting there, the, 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 there's a touchiness to the cultural discussions, which I think is fascinating. You quote David Landis in, in the beginning of one of the chapters that says that culture in the sense of inner values and attitudes that guide a population frightens scholars. And, and some people might be feeling uneasy because we're, it sounds like we're saying that Russians are, are corrupt and maybe we're criticizing Russians as a people and this, this seems to make people uneasy. Is that – it does make people uneasy but should we not feel that way? Well, I suppose the question is whether you want to be polite or, or, or truthful. Is there a – can we tease out a causal direction for something like – let's call it cultural dishonesty um, that – so is it is it the dishonesty that is causing then the inequality, or do we know if it's the inequality that goes on to cause the dishonesty? That you know, if you if you grow up without a lot of security, um, you grow up without a lot of resources, you're going to be much more willing to steal and otherwise bend the rules than someone who's a bit more secure. Well, that, that's an interesting thesis. I don't know of a speck of evidence in favor of it, and I know of many uh, pieces of evidence from around the world but the other way. That, uh, for example, when the Japanese were working in California as domestic servants and as um, oh, the gardeners, the Japanese gardener was once an institution in California, uh, and, and they had access to people's homes, 
Uh, they either they or people they know could have burglarized those homes and so forth. And they didn't do it. Uh, you could run a, run a long list of other people who didn't do those things. This notion that you can uh, reduce all bad actions to uh, uh, bad things that other people have done to those who committed those actions just doesn't stand up. I grew up, uh, you know, in Harlem in the 1940s and 1950s, and I never heard a gunshot in all that time. And I have relatives who grew up in uh, similar low-income black neighborhoods in uh, Washington. And I've asked them, did you ever hear a gunshot when you were growing up? And the answer was no. Uh, other relatives in North Carolina have posed the same question and got the same answer. So it's no, there's, no there is not a predestination uh, to, to poverty that leads to bad uh, actions. Because if that was true, uh, things would have been far worse uh, in terms of violence uh, in, uh, in places like Harlem uh, in, the, in the 40s and 50s than they are today, when in fact, uh, just the opposite is the case. And what we're discussing, that's an interesting uh, segue into your discussions of African-American culture, uh, which is discussed a lot in different ways. Uh, you, do, you make a good case that, that there's been – and you've made in many of your books that there's been a pronounced change in African-American culture that cannot be attributed to the legacy of slavery, uh, most likely to the welfare state. Uh, but then, of course, now that's a very uneasy thesis for a lot of people to make and for a while because it seems like we're – everyone says blaming the victim is the problem here. And of course, we also have the issue that there are some bona fide racists who might cover up their bona fide racism by blaming uh, black culture. Uh, is, that, is that the kind of thing that we should be concerned about when we discuss issues in African-American culture, especially in the poverty of African-American uh, cities or neighborhoods? Well, we, we know – that there are racists now, but we also should know that there were a lot more of them in the past and that black communities did not have the crime rate and especially not the murder rates that they have today. So uh, there, there are racists. They are not omnipotent. Out of curiosity, the, the other thing that happened in the late 60s um, was the war on drugs, the ramping up of the war on drugs. So is there – can we draw a link between – the crime that happens in poor communities and – because so much of it is drug-related? Oh, I suppose one, one could try that. Uh, incidentally, uh, the, 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 one of the big complaints uh, about the drug laws is that uh, they distinguish between crack cocaine, which is more, is more common in black communities, uh, and, and the other forms, and, and that their laws prescribe uh, tougher sentences for crack cocaine. Uh, again, the facts go completely against the, 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 the narrative. It was black communities, uh, black members of Congress, black leaders of all sorts who, who insisted in times past that there be stronger sentences for crack cocaine than for other cocaine. And yet many of those same leaders and spokesmen, etc., are saying now that's white racism. It was, it's, it's a matter of record that the black leaders demanded that, rightly or wrong. The, the other factor that people might get uneasy about when we talk about culture, uh, whether it's with African Americans or, or Tamils in Sri Lanka or, or overseas Chinese, as you've written uh, about, is whether or not you're bringing up uh, IQ and me or mental capabilities, as, as you title it, uh, which is, of course, a huge third way rail that uh, is not, people do not like to touch. You have a very good explanation for why uh, the IQ question is, is a little bit more muddy than, uh, than just saying that these cultures have higher IQs. Well, yes, uh, the, the, the argument that for, for genetic determinism is as weak as the argument for other kinds of determinism. Uh, for example, uh, there's, there's one genetic determinist who has uh, ca calculated the IQs of countries around the world, median IQ, uh, and the uh, per capita uh, uh, GDP, and he's found that there's a correlation. Well, yes, fine. Uh, but causation, correlation is not causation. And if you say that it's due to the race, then you're left with to, to answer the question, why is it? that the same race, in this case the Chinese, were world leaders for centuries on end, and then lagged, declined into third world countries, also for centuries on end. Uh, the, 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 was there some genetic 
change that swept over the Chinese uh, and, and, and when, when this turnaround came. Uh, what we know from history is that the Chinese government changed its policies in order to isolate China from the rest of the world. And one of the themes of the book, isolation is highly correlated with poverty, no matter where it is, whether it's isolation in the mountains, social isolation, uh, political isolation, whatever, it's highly correlated with, 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 with uh, backwardness. And so uh, people who were world leaders in scientific and technological things for, for, for centuries descended after they were isolated uh, to become third world countries and pray to other countries that uh, took advantage of them. Does this mean that we can be more optimistic going forward with the growth of technologies that allow us to be in constant contact with each other and with people all over the world? I mean the internet, social media, all of that, will that cut back on this problem of isolation? Well, it, 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 it might, but, but it, it also uh, – I, I, I'm, I'm uh, not optimistic about panaceas. There have been too many of them. Uh, the internal culture of a group depends upon what they do with the social media. Uh, if, they, if they spend their time uh, watching pornography uh, or, or, or organizing uh, uh, riots, uh, then uh, that, that's one thing. But, the, but people are not are not the same. They're, they're not going to look at the same opportunities the same way. So we look at all these factors, um, and and in the book, there there you do a very good job of explaining in many different contexts uh, how all these factors play together. But the, but then when we talk about the political implications of it, um, that's when we we really see the the sort of relevance of people. Oh, are we talking about all this history and rivers? Because it's very important, as we mentioned. And there's a there's a cliche that you like you bring up. Uh, which I, I've heard a lot of my progressive friends say, which is the paradox of poverty in an affluent society. Essentially, the idea that why why do why are there even poor people here in America or other affluent societies? What's wrong with that with that complaint? Oh my gosh! Almost everything. The fact that you are physically present where other people are productive does not mean that you are productive. And uh, if, you, if you say that that can be cured by simply taking some of what they produce and giving it to you, uh, that's been tried too, and it doesn't work because what really matters is the human capital, and you cannot confiscate human capital. Uh, what you can do is try to spread human capital, and, and it's one of the few things that you can give to others without having any less of it for yourself. Uh, so it, it's, it's a wonderful thing insofar as people take the presence of groups that uh, do have a lot of human capital and, and use that as an example uh, to follow. That almost never happens. The political, the political incentives are to promote resentment of those people who are more productive, who have more human capital. And this is around the world on every inhabited continent. So this is not peculiar to the United States or any other particular country. Uh, and so long as the politicians have an incentive to do that and people have desires to believe such things, uh, that going that route is not going to get you anywhere. Isn't this all a bit fatalistic? So you've said that geography matters and can have an impact on culture and culture. So even then, if people – even if they move, um, they may – they'll bring, still bring their culture with them if they have access to technology. How they use it, whether they use it to better themselves or not is going to be influenced by the behaviors that they learned that we can't really fix it after the fact by, say, redistribution. Uh, does this – what, is, what does this do for us as far as addressing – because we all want to see a decrease or in an ideal world an eradication of poverty. Um, and, and you seem to be saying that those of us who are in a position to give resources, make programs, institute policies are not in any way the, the cause, either the initial cause or the ongoing cause of the, the poverty of various groups or individuals. So – where do we go from there? Do we just say, well, you know, the poor are there, the poor are poor, and it's it's their fault, and they need to figure it out? And are they capable of figuring out if it's all ingrained culture that they learned from an early age? No, the, the short answer is no. The idea that third parties, that there's a limit to what third parties can do, but one of the things they can do is stop making things worse. We have, we look at the case of blacks. 
for heaven's sakes, blacks were freed in, uh, in, in the 1860s. By, by 1900, most blacks were literate. That doesn't sound like much of an impressive record uh, uh, unless you realize that people in Romania were not, most people in, your, in Romania were not literate decades later. And most people in India were not literate until half a century after the people in Romania were literate. So it's not inevitable. A lot of progress took place. Uh, for example, in the 1940s, the, the uh, homicide rate among black males declined by 18 percent, and in, 19, in the 1950s, it declined by another 22 percent. So the, the notion that, that there's no progress possible, but it's in the 1960s when these terribly bright ideas were all the rage and were put into effect. That's when the downward movement in the murder rate reversed itself skyrocketed by 89 percent, wiping out all the progress of the 40s and 50s. So the first thing sh should be, I guess this goes way back to Greek times, you know, do no harm. If, if, uh, if, if the uh, people on the left would just stop doing harm, it's amazing how much uh, other people can do. And education, most of the great ideas that came, the supposedly great ideas that came in in the 60s have made the education situation worse. Uh, but, but right now, in, the, in, many, in many of the charter schools, uh, the black kids uh, are scoring uh, at levels uh, uh, that other people score in, in the affluent suburbs, while the black kids in the regular public schools uh, are scoring below the 10th percentile. And in many cases, the charter school and the public school are physically located in the same building. They don't go around building a lot of... Uh, of separate schools for charter schools. And so you have kids from the same ghetto neighborhood uh, in the, being educated in the same building and one set of them scoring near the top and the other set scoring down at, at the bottom. And it's not because the, 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 the people, the kids who are in the charter schools were cherry picked. They were selected by lottery. It was pure chance who, 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 the, lottery, who the charter schools get. And so there are things that are working, but those things that are working are not in vogue. Uh, they don't minister to the political or ideological uh, satisfaction of people who are involved in these kinds of things. And therefore, many people who think that they're friends of blacks are opposed to charter schools, for example, along with many other things that are, that are helpful that they're opposed to. Your book seems to have in, immense ramifications for a word that has become pretty pretty common, uh, at least particularly recently, and you write about it in the book, which is the word privilege. Uh, check your privilege. Are, are, are you a privileged minority or are you a privileged individual? Uh, what does the word privilege mean to you and why is it being misused? Well, a privilege is some – well, it, 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 the root of it is that it's a private law that you, you have your own different set of laws by which you are allowed to play. Uh, and, but the main thing to me is that uh, a privilege exists – uh, uh, ex ante, it exists at the beginning uh, as a precondition for what com comes afterwards. But an achievement is what what is what is actually done afterwards. They're two. They're fundamentally different concepts. And and therefore, it, it just, does this affect how we should think about inequality? We should be. There are people who achieve, and a lot of people would say, okay, so. People who have achieved will often say that it's my hard work that made me achieve, uh, which is a which tend to be the story you tell yourself. But why why should we treat achievement then different than understanding that they came from a place that might have been ahead of other people to begin with? Because one thing an achievement, especially in a market economy, is not simply a benefit to the person who achieves. If someone becomes a surgeon. Yes, that will raise his income, but he will save lives over the course of his career. And so it's not just a question of him versus somebody else. It's a, a society is better off when it has more people who can become surgeons and fewer people who become criminals. Or even fewer – I mean a lot of surgeons would be good in general. Fewer people who – as productivity grows, which you really – focus on the idea that productivity is really what we're talking about in terms of getting people into careers that give back. I mean that's – right. If you're not – you can't be productive. There's a great line when you say like people always blame greed but just the fact of wanting money doesn't mean that people will give you money. You have to give back to get it. That's right. Uh, it's, it's a, I, I, 
I'm among the people that, that drive me crazy are people on college admissions uh, boards who are talking about how we must be fair to this applicant. Because applicant A, you see, had all the privileges, and applicant B, you know, didn't didn't have them, and therefore we must make adjustments as if we're God on Judgment Day. Uh, no, uh, educational institutions do not exist simply to provide benefits to the people who pass through those institutions. Society creates these institutions uh, so that people will come out of them and create benefits for the society at, lar at large. I mean, when someone like uh, Jonas Salt went to a, uh, a public, a, a selected per public school in New York, a uh, free, free obviously, uh, and then on to a selected public college that was also free in those days, uh, uh, he would. He created a polio vaccine that benefited everybody of every race, color, creed, income level, nationality, all around the world. And that's what, what the educational institution is supposed to produce, people who produce benefits for others, not simply uh, make higher and have higher incomes for themselves. But let me try to push back or at least defend this particular use of privilege from the perspective of the political left because I think a lot of them would say, well, no, we recognize the person who becomes a surgeon will become fairly wealthy um, and does that by saving lives. Um, and we were not upset about the um, the professional athletes who get paid a lot. What we're upset about is exactly the the kind of corruption that you were just talking about. Is the the non productive? Is you know I think it's two out of three or seven out of the ten richest zip codes in the country are located within commuting distance of Washington, D.C., and it's unlikely that those people are getting that money by being productive. They're, they're in fact privileged in exactly the way that you define privilege, which is they're, they're taking advantage of laws in the system. Likewise, the Occupy Wall Street kids were not mad at Steve Jobs. They were mad at Wall Street bankers who were colluding with government to rig the game in their favor. And so maybe what's instead going on is they're seeing the inequality as symptomatic of Wait, corruption. Rig what game in what way? It's so easy to throw these phrases around. What game did they rig and in what way? The Wall Street people. Well, I think the theory is they, they got Goldman Sachs got uh, you know special privileges. There, there are a lot of exemptions for Goldman Sachs to trade in special ways, for example, things like this. The rules of the game aren't equal even for tra trading entities. I mean, that's what lobbyists do is they try to change the laws to work in their favor. Now, in no society that I know of is there no corruption. And yet some societies are vastly richer than others. So to say that corruption must be uh, the reason for the, for, for the, for the wealth, it goes against the, all the evidence. Uh, the corrupt societies, even when they have all kinds of other advantages, rich natural resources and all the rest of it, uh, are seldom prosperous. So it's one thing to say that corruption exists. It's another thing to say that it's general and, and, that, and still another thing to say that that is the reason for the uh, disparities that we see. There's a part in the book that uh, I think is particularly relevant to modern day – well, there's a really good – in terms of politics in general but maybe what we're seeing in this election year. You discuss how, how politicians treat – and you kind of mentioned this before. They treat productive minorities, um, and and how they kind of rabble rouse in such a way for productive minorities. And there's a part where he says that sometimes a particular skilled and talented demagogue, you say, uh, can froth up resent it, resentment. Uh, that's a pretty common pattern. I mean, we might be seeing a particularly skilled demagogue right now. Yes. And and it's it's a worldwide pattern too. Is this this is something that, in terms of trying to find out. Uh, to get people to focus on their own path in life rather than their belief that other people who are more quote unquote privileged took from them in some way, which is important to do, I would say, if you want a society to advance. I, I think that the, the, uh, the spread of Marxism around the world is really an incredible phenomenon matched only by a very few uh, religions. Uh, uh, the speed with which it spread and the fervor with which it was believed. And it's based on the notion that the, that the rich have gotten rich by exploiting the poor. And if that was so, uh, then you would expect ordinary people in countries run by Marxists uh, to have a higher standard of living than ordinary people in countries run by uh, where there's a capitalist economy. 
And yet, in, in reality, you see the exact op opposite. And nevertheless, this doctrine has persisted for 100 years. Well, one reason it seems that you mentioned this as one of your uh, sort of things that these demagogues can tell productive, the productive minorities or maybe other minorities is that the idea that something is not your fault seems pretty attractive to people, especially if you see yourself as relatively poor. I mean, we see that throughout the world, I would say. Well, I think, I think in, in a sense, it is not people's fault. People in the mountains, it's not their fault that they were born in the mountains. They had nothing to say about that. But if you were, were born in the mountains, the chances of your doing well in the world are reduced enormously. One of the Hoover fellows, uh, Angelo Colo Cotevilla, who was here some years ago, once pointed out that you could draw a map across the, a line across the map of Europe. Uh, and he described how that line would be drawn. And that your life is going to be very different if you were born east or west of that line. Uh, and so, uh, that, that, so in that sense, it's not their fault. We're not, we're, uh, when we try to look for fault, uh, we're ignoring causation, which is something entirely different. So this book is, as we said at the beginning, you have written an astonishing number of books in your career. So how does this one – fit into that overall project? Do you see yourself as having an overall project in the, the scope of your work? And then how does this book play into that? I, I guess I write one book at a time. And uh, a very wise lady told me many years ago, do not assume that everyone who, who reads your book has already read your previous books. And so uh, this book has grown out of research that much of which, some of which have appeared in other books and is brought together in a different way now. Um, but I, but there are so many things that still at this late date need to be uh, re-examined. I mean, just listening to the presidential debate the other night uh, that left me aghast. Uh, within the first 15 minutes, both candidates said uh, repeated fallacies that had been uh, refuted uh, decades ago, or in some sense, in some cases, uh, centuries ago. Uh, so so there, there's work to be done, and I tried to do it. One of the things that we haven't talked about are all the income statistics that are thrown around with such utter recklessness. That was my next question, actually. So please. Go ahead. Go ahead and ask it this. Yeah. What, what is wrong with income inequality statistics? Because we're, we're, we talk a lot about the fairness and, and these statistics on free thought. So, and you do a very good job of explaining this. Well, the biggest problem is they refer to a particular income brackets as if they contain the same people, and they don't. Uh, most people, if you stop and think about it, it's very simple. They start out in entry-level jobs, uh, and, they, and over the years, they rise up to, into higher-paying jobs. They have their more experience, training, and education, the whole, the whole bit. I mean, I mean, my first job paid me $2 a day. Uh, fortunately, Stanford University does not pay me $2 a day now. You have statistics that are about brackets rather than people. Let me put it differently. The kinds of statistics that are much more rare are the statistics that take a given set of human beings and follow those human beings over time and reach conclusions based on that. The conclusions you reach from those kinds of statistics are the direct opposite of the conclusions that you hear uh, so much talked about. For example, how the top 10% or 1% or whatever uh, are getting a, uh, over a period of time are getting virtually all of the benefits of the economy. Uh, if you follow those people who were initially in the top 10% and you come back at the end of a decade, you will find that they made uh, less of, a, of an in, uh, improvement in income than the people who are in the bottom 20%, let's say. Uh, uh, but of course, they're different people. The, the turnover, uh, most Americans do not stay in the same 20% uh, for, for, for more than one decade much less over a lifetime. And so we're talking about phantom people when we're talking about these various percentages. Is there a type of inequality that matters? With all yes. the discussion of inequality, it's, is, is there one that matters? Yes, all of them matter. The question is, what, what, what can you do about it? And you, and you can't decide that by, by arbitrarily assuming things that are, that are demonstrably false. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.